everyone. It is time for this week's live stream. Chris, you are first. Good job, Mr. Fireman. Uh, this week's uh, live stream is going to be talking about spawning and the different things that spawn in our aquariums. We talked about this about a year ago, and it just seemed like I saw something yesterday. I was like, oh, it's time to revive that topic, because why not? Hi, Mina. Yep, you are second. Uh, hopefully audio is good. I bought brand new batteries, and then when it was time to set up, my package uh, that I used to have had a couple left. I'm like, oh, well, what the heck? I thought I had zero. So I tried them out, and they did nothing. So I tried some more out. <laughs> if we lose audio, I will have to break up with a brand new package. But I hate to waste anything, and I definitely don't want to throw away batteries that are still good. So we are going to take a chance. Uh, did you notice... I uploaded a video last night at 3 in the morning my time. Uh, it's a huge video, uh, literally in size. It's a 45-minute video that gives you a behind-the-scenes tour of Planet Aquariums where I got to visit and explore for a few days, and I filmed everything, and I made a long video because you know me. <clears throat> but it was uh, 8.2 gigs or 8.5 gigs in size. That is a monster file. And seven years ago, I uploaded a video showing Joe's 20,000-gallon reef tank in Long Island Aquarium. And I remember that one was 2.1 gigs, and it took six hours to upload. But nowadays, with GigaSpeed, I was able to upload this 45-minute video in 4K. I don't think it took three minutes flat, but it took YouTube 30 minutes to decide if it was going to break any copyright laws. <laughs> So they analyzed the heck out of every second of that video. And then finally, like I said, 30 minutes, you know, so the upload was nothing. And then I had to wait and wait and wait before I could hit publish. So I finally went to bed. I feel like it was four in the morning. So if you haven't had a chance to watch it yet, I hope you enjoy it. If you feel like it's too long, so sorry. That's just how I edit. I, I know I could trim stuff down to a three minute <clears throat> nothing, but then it's nothing. You don't learn anything. You don't gain anything and you end up with more questions than answers. And I can't help myself. I always have to be informative. <clears throat> I would, uh, I kind of am jealous of those people that can knock out these little tiny things and, and go super viral. But I'm more about, uh, let's just get our feet, you know, firmly anchored and take in some information and walk away knowing more than you did before you started the video. So, hope you enjoyed it. The, um, the tank that they built for me, it's still in the back room because I haven't built the new stand yet. That will be happening shortly. Uh, you know, I don't know. It could be happening during the month of June. And as soon as the stand is built and the canopy, I can go ahead and then I have to choose the color. And I don't know what color to go with because <clears throat> I originally, a long time ago, said, oh, I'm going to use cherry wood, the look of cherry. And I actually was going to use real cherry wood, which I'm sure right now is unaffordable wood. <laughs> But uh, the benefit of that one is when you uh, varnish it, it won't look cherry at first, but as it gets older, it gets more and more of that reddish hue. So that was my plan a long time ago, and as you can tell, I never did any woodwork anyway. And so now I'm thinking, no, I'll probably just use some regular nice plywood, and I'm debating colors. Now my brand new tile floor is deep, dark walnut brown. <coughs> <coughs> so if I uh, use dark brown, it's going to kind of all look the same. If I were to use something like white, which could look nice and clean, that may conflict with the remodel of the kitchen that I'm planning to do later this year or early next spring, where I was kind of thinking making everything white in there. And so then I have this white that continues all the way around the aquarium, so it doesn't really stand out. I can't make up my mind. I don't like white wash. It's not a, a good look to me. It looks old and dated. So I have to make a decision. I might just go white. I might just keep it simple. I've got my gray walls, got my red accent wall, and then I'll turn around and have white cabinetry and white woodwork around the aquariums, and and we'll just have to deal. We'll just have to like it. We'll just have to like it. Yeah. Or I could do what you guys saw with the Planet Aquarium video. Some of you saw it already, where they do black stain on everything. So black would be different than the dark brown. It might hide a lot of sins. I don't know. It could look good. So that is a... For another day for me to decide. I have to think about it. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, before I talk about today's topic, I do want to talk about dosing my aquarium because, you know, this channel does give you updates on what's going on with the tank. 
the Reef Diary series has been revived. And if you're not a subscriber to this channel, then you don't know when I'm sneaking these out. And the only way you would is if I put a post on Instagram or Facebook to let you know. And I don't always do that. So if you aren't a subscriber, please do subscribe and click that little bell because the bell gives you the notifications on your tablets and smartphones. But uh, the Reef Diary series has resumed and it's as there's something to share rather than every single day there's a show. So, you know, there may be a period where there's like one every single day for seven days in a row. And then it could be where it's two or three days and nothing and then boom, you get another one. So if you don't want to miss those, the one thing is I do continue to add them to the same playlist. And as that playlist gets longer, um, you will have more to binge if you choose to do so. Those videos tend to be about four minutes long on average. I found a link, I think I don't think I mentioned this yet here, but I found a link on when I was Googling to figure out how long a playlist is. Of course, there's something. Someone's already come up with a, a calculator out there. And currently, the uh, playlist for the Reef Diary series is about 10 hours total with about 144 videos. And they average about four minutes each. Some are longer and some are super short. So it averages to about four, four and a half minutes of video. Uh, the dosing that I wanted to tell you guys about are these little things right here behind me. Uh, so I've been dosing Prodibio for a decade. And I always put in Bioptim, BioDigest, Stronti Plus, and IOD Plus. And I do that twice a month unless I forget. And it takes a little, you know, then it's not quite twice a month. It might be once that month. And when I did my ICP testing about six weeks ago, I was missing a lot of trace elements. So I thought, I'm going to have to buy a bottle of iron. I got to buy a bottle of manganese. I got to buy a bottle of this. I got to find out what has cobalt in it. I got to find out what has uh, chromium, you know, just the things we never, ever measure for. And I had gotten these coral essential bottles, these little guys right here, which I mentioned in one of those Reef Diaries recently. So I had these sitting on the shelf for a long time, super long time, actually. And they were sent to me saying, try these out. And I kept thinking, how am I going to know this did anything? My tank is already doing well. If I just add something, I don't know that I'm saying this made a difference. So I didn't use it. I just didn't see the point. However, once I had my ICP results showing I was deficient in so many trace elements, and I started looking at those bottles, I saw that each bottle had some of the very trace elements I need the most right now that, that are measuring nothing. And to bring those up, and I thought, huh. So if I were to dose this every single day, like it says on the bottle, for about two weeks or, or until the bottles are empty, and then send up another ICP test, in theory, all those values should come up. And that way I could say this product works. It's proof. So I'm in the middle of right now of testing that theory out. And I joined a Facebook group specifically for Coral Essentials. And one of their mm, people, <laughs> I don't know if it's somebody in the company or if it's a, an avid hobbyist or if it's an importer, I don't know who it is. But this person wrote me a direct message and said, hey, I really would like to discuss with you your tank. And especially since you're running a calcium reactor and I help people that run calcium reactors to figure out the trace uh, uh, dosing regime that, regime that they recommend, regiment that they recommend. So uh, I told them what I had. I told them what I'm using. And I was told we're sending you more of a different thing, which is actually something you can't get in the US right now. I keep forgetting the initials, but apparently it's a larger bottle with a three-letter name like CRE or CXE or XCR or I don't know, something like that. And you can hook it up to a dosing pump. And one pump will put in all three of the trace elements at once. And then the other two are a type of coral power, coral amino acid type stuff, which I can do manually. So that is on the way. I don't know when I'm going to get it because, you know, it's coming from Australia and it's going to take a little while to get here. But... In the meantime, I'm going to use up these bottles and send off my first test and see what I get. And then when I switch over to that other bottle that they're sending me, I will then do another follow-up and with ICP and see what I get again. And that way we'll just know. I mean, it's just it's nice to know. It's I mean, I have used Acropower and cannot tell the difference. Other people use Acropower and they're said, Oh my god, my tank did so great. The group for Coral Essentials has a lot of people saying it it changed their lives. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, they are focusing specifically on something on an area that none of us typically as hobbyists think about, which is trace elements. We think about the big numbers, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. Of course, salinity, temperature are key. We worry about keeping nitrate and phosphate low, but not too low. And then, you know, as I've been promoting now for eight months, potassium matters. So these other ones are the ones we don't think about. We 
kind of don't care about. They're supposed to be included in the salt mix, so in theory, we shouldn't be deficit that. And yet, uh, this is not a new theory. Uh, years ago, Zeovit had a line of little blue bottles. I don't know what, were, what was in them. I know they were expensive. Um, the Moonshiner uh, uh, dosing regime is another uh, goal of dealing with a lot of trace elements and using extra things in there to get better coloration. Uh, Aqua Force has their own line. You know, Red Sea's got a few of their things, like AB Plus and so forth. So there's lots of different things in the market, and I'm trying out Coral Essentials. If you're using it now, I'd love to hear your feedback. If you're not using it yet, you know, it's something that maybe down the line you'll say, oh, I want to get into that as well. It's uh, totally up to you. Okay. So we are going to talk about spawning, and I want to talk about the different things that typically spawn in our aquariums. And I want to let you know, and I put it already in this video's uh, description, there's a short playlist on my YouTube channel, which has, I think, five different videos of spawning events that happened in my aquariums over the years. So if um, you wanted to watch those and just kind of, I mean, they're all short, but you could just check them out and you could see some of these things that I'll be describing today. And then, of course, you can start Googling and you can start YouTube searching and you'll find all kinds of events that deal with spawning in the reef tank. But uh, I thought the reason we would talk about it is because every time people see this, there's a lot of mixed reactions. Uh, first reaction typically is, oh my God, it's so cute. How do I keep it alive? Second reaction is like, oh my God, my water's turning so cloudy, is everything going to die? So <laughs> two extremes right there. We need to kind of get right back into the middle and say, what is the situation? How dire is it? Do I need to interact? Can I ignore it? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So we're going to talk about that. Let's start off with um, the most common thing people see in their tank spawn first. Do you have any guesses? If you guess snails, that's a great guess. So often people will put snails in their tank and then one day they just see this gray cloud coming out of their snail and they said, what is happening? It looks like my snail is smoking. And everyone then of course gets you know involved in the potty humor and they just like, oh, your snail's getting it on. Play some more Barry White, you know, the whole, and you know, they tease you. And people are like, oh, okay, it's okay then. My snail is not dying. I'm like, no, no, it's not dying at all. <laughs> it's trying to make more of itself. So snails will do this. They will emit the sperm into the water column. Uh, I have not seen, <clears throat> well, I'm not going to go there. I do want to tell you that you may also see on the glass of your aquarium these little tiny like clear circles that have little white dots in them. That would be snail eggs. So you could have the spawning that's coming from male snails. You could have the egg laying of other snails. I was going to say, I'm not sure if there's some kind of a cross-fertilization thing going on there with once the sperm goes out, does it find some eggs to fertilize more snails or not? Because I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that eggs that are being laid oftentimes can emerge from those little clear sacs and you could end up with some small, tiny, itty bitty snails. Or your fish may say, oh, look, tiny itty bitty snacks. I can just go ahead and eat these. And you don't get any tiny snails. And you thought, oh, where did they go? Uh, I know that in the past when I would have snails on the glass, I would try to clean around those egg sacs and I would just keep erasing all the rest of the algae, but you know, try not to hit those things. But it's very rare that I, I was able to discover new snails in my tank. Typically the ones I do find are always microscopic. I uh, was going through a lot of old pictures this week because I was looking for something. And I'm not getting into that, but I did want to tell you that I found a bunch of pictures from my old frag tank, you know, my frag tank when it was older, or when it was younger, you know, when it was years ago, when I had a ton of serith baby snails. Serith snails usually make these long, elongated shells, and I had tons of these little ones, and they were amazing, and I don't, I don't even know how it worked, but somehow my tank was filled with them, and that was really, really cool. But that is the first one I want to talk about when it came to spawning. Let me put a check mark next to that so I don't get distracted. Um, if we talk about fish spawning in the tank, clownfish are known to lay a clutch of eggs and, and you're on the rock work or on the glass. And a lot of people get excited about that. And I, I mean, it's cool, right? I mean, it's an exciting thing, but they always think, okay, so now I'm gonna have a ton of little clownfish and that's not how it works in a reef tank. The tiny, clownfish fry that will release into the water column 
basically eight days after they were first laid, will just disappear. I mean, it's really fast. They, they release into the water column just after lights out and they are attracted to light sources. So anything that's got a light on that will go toward it. And invariably they will either be devoured by other things or they will be uh, sucked into your filtration and uh, be you know, destroyed because that is just the nature of clownfish. You know, baby clownfish fry do not survive. And it makes me wonder how on earth do they survive in the ocean? I mean, seriously, think about this. You're a clownfish. You've got your clownfish husband, because you're the girl. You're uh, laying your clutch of eggs on the side of a rock. And then your husband comes over and fertilizes them. And you think you've done a great job. And you know technically, you have to go out and get the food, and he's going to guard the eggs. That's literally how this works. However, everything else in the ocean is always looking for something to eat. So number one, everything's going to be trying to go at those eggs, and the male is going to spend a lot of time defending it instead of going out looking for food, and so there's that. And then when finally these eggs release, they are attracted to any light source, any light source. The moon is a big old light source, right? So I picture them all swimming upward toward the moon and all of the fish gobbling them up because now they're free swimming and they're easy to gather. I don't understand how we still have clownfish left in the ocean because that seems like a horrible recipe for success. And I, uh, you know, if they were all like going straight down into a rocky hole and just staying in there until they got bigger, that would make more sense to me. But they swim and they swim toward the light. So can you do it? Yes. Do you have to capture the eggs? Absolutely. Are there methods of doing it? Yes. There is a thing out there that my friend Chad Vossen made years ago called the Vossen Larval Catcher. And you hung it in the front of the tank. It had little tiny air stone pump and a tiny LED light on there and you made the room pitch dark and that way when the fish release or when the eggs released from the from the rock when they started swimming they would go toward that light they'd go into the trap and they'd be waiting in there and then you could come there a couple of hours later and retrieve them you could wait till the next morning they'd still be in the trap but they don't live very long so you have to you know retrieve them rather quickly and then transfer them to a separate tank with no filtration I would imagine it's just going to be a tank with phytoplankton, rotifers, and an air stone. I've never bred clownfish, so I don't know the exact regime. But I do know they have to be away from the parents and away from all the other fish and all the other things in your reef tank. They've got to be separate. And then you go through this whole thing of trying to get them to stay alive. And you're trying to make sure they have enough food. And you are going to wait for a period called settlement. And then eventually they will start to look like tiny fish instead of little commas and then you uh you know you'll start to you know see them grow and you'll have some die and you know you start off with 100 and you're down to 20 and then you're down to seven you know i mean it's kind of a thing and then eventually you have a fish big enough that you could actually possibly after six to nine months put it back in your reef <laughs> which is kind of fun but uh it, it's quite the undertaking and so most people that see their clowns laying a clutch of eggs whether it's once in a blue moon or if it's every 14 days like clockwork, they consider that to be fish food because when those release, other fish will eat them and you know benefit from it. Okay, clownfish are done. Um, anemones is another big one. I've seen this happen many, many times. I've tried to figure out if it was a seasonal thing or if it's just a sporadic thing. You know, what makes anemones spawn? And most people observe, uh, like the bubble tip anemone, emitting the smoky, wispy, gray stuff into the water column, and the tank just gets cloudier and cloudier, and the anemone uh, just keeps pumping the stuff out. Oh, just thought of something else that spawns. The uh, anemone will have a certain look that I recognize immediately. If, if it's that certain shape, I know that night it will spawn. The tentacles, uh, they look like stalagmites when it's gonna spawn. They just are wider at the base and they're really engorged and they come to a, a pointy tip. They're in. Now these, my bubble tip anemones don't have bubbles. So I can't say what a normal bubble tip looks like. Mine always look like a long tentacle. And when they do this thing where they look like stalagmites, that is the night they're going to spawn. And the cloudy water will then ensue. And here is the thing. 
if you have a lot of anemones, if they're all spawning at the same time, if your ecosystem is small, the more sperm that's in the water column, the more the oxygen level could be dropping. Filter socks could be overflowing, skimmers could be volcanoing, it could be a real thing. So if you are dealing with a small nano system with spawning anemones and you have several, you may be looking at having to immediately deal with a water change, possibly run some carbon, add an aerostone to the tank. You may actually have to intercede. In my situation, I, I didn't run into that problem. My 29 gallon had a large sump underneath that basically almost doubled the water volume. And when my anemone spawned, it just the tank got cloudy for a few hours and the next morning it was crystal clear. Uh, and then I had, at one point in my reefing career, I had this angled tank by the front door that had a rose anemone in it. And then behind me, I had a 280 gallon tank that had bubble tip anemones in it. And one night I was, you know, watching TV and I looked over the tank and the tank was cloudy. I was like, what is going on? And I checked and the, I, I mean, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't check. It was full of cloud. I mean, it was like trying to, you know, the flashlight, I'm trying to look into the reef and, you know, you can see things through the, through the fog. It was bad. So I thought, well, let me go look at the angle tank because it's tied into the same sump. And I want to see if that tank clouded up as well because they're all sharing the same water. And this cloud should be migrating through the plumbing through the return pump and filling that tank up. And what I saw was shocking to me, so much so that I ran for the camera and filmed it and it's part of the spawning list and it's something you don't see. So if you haven't seen that video yet, check out the Rose Bubble Tip spawning video because it released thousands upon thousands of eggs and eggs from anemones is far less seen than sperm. Must be, <laughs> it's like this hobby, nine guys and one woman. <clears throat> Uh, have a reef tank, right? 90% male, 10% female. And in the, the case of uh, anemones, it seems like there's a lot of males and there's only a few females, I suppose. And it was funny because I named that rose bubble tip Rose, not knowing if it was male or female. It just made sense. And now I said, oh, well, now I know it's a female because it laid eggs. It, it laid eggs. It released eggs into the water column. So this clutch of eggs came out it's this big chunk. It was this, this big brown thing. I'm like, what the heck is in my water? And it, it kind of drifted upward and the vortex went Poof! And there was like a billion eggs blowing around. And that's when I was grabbing the camera and trying to film it. So you can check that out. Now, I never <clears throat> ended up with a bunch of little tiny rows or, or, or tan colored bubble tip and enemies elsewhere in my system. So it didn't work out. I, they didn't turn into anything. If they had possibly spawned in... I don't know if they were in a big Rubbermaid trough and perhaps the protein skimmer isn't turned on, then that sperm and eggs in there, they could have possibly settled out and possibly you'd have little tiny ones showing up on the base of the big vessel. But in a reef tank, again, it's not likely you're going to suddenly have extra anemones from a spawning event. So uh, if you're hoping for that, don't get your hopes up. If you're worried about it, it comes down to the water, the water volume of your system. So if you can just uh, analyze your situation and see what's going on. If you have a controller, you can look at readings like pH levels dropping. You can see if the ORP is plummeting. These are some clues about oxygen levels. And like I said, having a weighted air stone, you know, like a ceramic air stone. You can get these at Petco or PetSmart or Amazon. Just put that in there and make it sink to the bottom of the tank and hook it up to an air pump and get that thing just pumping air in. It's a good way to overcome low oxygen in a system when the water is not clear. Uh, I want to tell you about another anemone story. This one was a funny one to me. Funny to me. Not humorous, just odd. Uh, I was at a trade show and, you know, one of these frag swaps or something, and one of the vendors had a bag to the side of his tank, just a bag, a bag of water, and you could see there was a small anemone in there. I think it was a rock anemone, not you know, a bubble tip. And I'm looking at it, and I said, did you, did, I, did you sell this? Did someone forget to take what they bought? He says, no, I'm not putting that in my tank because you know I'm trying to sell corals here today. And I looked at it, and he says, take a good look. And you could see all these eggs, and that anemone was just spitting out eggs. So that was another female. And that happened right in the bag before it could even be unbagged and put into a tank of water. So this could happen, and it, it's kind of a cool thing. I mean, life finds a way. Jeff Goldblum was right. Uh, another thing that can spawn would be Tubastria. 
which is a sun coral. It's one of my favorite corals. They're beautiful. They open up these bright yellow and orange flower polyps. You know, there's big, huge, gorgeous flowers. And they have to be fed all the time. They, they live in caves. They actually never see the light of day, typically, in nature. And if you're feeding them well and they're, they're fat and sassy, they can spawn. And one night, <clears throat> I went to my frag tank that was on the end of the 400 gallon. I had one next to this tank, a little one, for, I don't know, six, seven years. And it was just 10 gallons plumbed into the main reef. And every night I would close the valve and I would feed my sun corals and, you know, kind of look at the different frags and see how they were doing and pull out Valonia because there was always green, uh, green bubble algae in there all the time. And one night I walked past that tank, you know, it was late at night and I, I guess I flipped on the light or something. And I saw little orbs just blowing all over the tank. And as I was like, what are these coming from? That's weird. And I looked and I could see I had what are called black tubastria which is funny because they're not really black in color. They're actually a deep, deep uh, hunter green. And they were spitting out the eggs out of the mouths of their polyps. And I was like, this is amazing. And I filmed it. And it's on this playlist. So you can watch that one as well. The, uh, that was a really cool one. And I've had people say, um, you know, I would love to get your tubastria and put it with my tubastria. Like you're going to rub them together and get more tubastria. Uh, usually the best way to get more tubastria is to feed, feed, feed. Uh, not rely on eggs to release and land somewhere else and hopefully turn into a coral. But those eggs would not be detrimental. They're just eggs. And those would be something everything else in the tank would eat. So if you had fish, they'd gobble them up and say, thank you very much for the delicious meal. Uh, I had a, uh, a coral that you would never think would spawn in your tank, and it's called Samacora. It is this encrusting coral. Uh, I've only seen it in two colors. It's either bright green or it's kind of like a honey brown. And I had the Samacora. I bought it because I liked the shape, the texture. It was this weird, lumpy, bumpy thing. I was like, oh, I need this coral. And then, you know, fast forward 10 years, I saw it again in a different color. I was like, I need this coral. So I've got Samacora in this tank that you guys never even know about. You've never even noticed it. And it's sitting in the back. It's that honey brown. It's hiding in the rock work. It's, it's scattered all over the place. I was showing it to Dwayne a few days ago. And I like it. So anyway, I had this green Samacora. And it was really, really pretty. And one day it was spawning, and it was releasing eggs. And I was just like, I didn't even know it had mouths. I mean, literally, when you look at this thing, it just is very, very short green hairs sticking off of it, like like a like an indoor outdoor carpet. I mean, just super short. And it doesn't ever look different. It always looks like that. You don't see them retracted. You don't see them extended. It's just this green cool textured coral and it releases uh, eggs into the water column and i had someone from houston immediately contact me who was an eric uh, was a uh, coral researcher eric borneman and he says i need a piece of your coral because i've got a male and i need a female so he was even back then you know 20 years ago they were trying to figure out how to uh get corals to spawn i think they called it in situ which is a way of doing it inside aquariums versus uh, waiting for it to happen out in the ocean and more and more of that is happening now by the way and we're going to get into that in a few minutes but the samacora was a really cool thing to see spawn and i wasn't expecting it either so uh, if you're trying to figure out how to spell that it is p s a m m a c o r a and uh, there's pictures of it on my website <clears throat> but not of the spawning uh, acropora are another coral that spawns in our tank and the acropora, you know, the, the branches of all these little polyps up going up the sides, and each of those can open up and release an egg bundle into the water column, and these will drift upward, and, uh, you know, your filtration will take care of it, or your fish will devour it. These, like I said, I mean, in a reef tank, it's amazing. Anything else lives. It's a good thing that we can frag and grow things out because the spawning events that we get to observe, if you notice them, uh, these spawning events, they don't result in a tank full of something. There are different ways corals can spread. Mushrooms can literally spin their foot around, well, not their foot, but their, their trunk round around like a balloon, like you're tying a, a knot on a balloon and they get that really tight spot and then they just break off and land somewhere else, that spreads. Others may literally droop and hang and th let their weight tear the, the meat of the coral until the frag is now sitting at the bottom and it'll start down there even though the mother colony is above it. That's a couple of ways. 
but you know normally for us we just cut it and glue it and put it here or put it there and that's how we get corals in our tank and if we want more we accidentally break one we put a piece in a new spot but sometimes things will jump across the tank on their own like uh, pasolipora where it will send out it's called polyp bailout and it just releases polyps into the water like uh like dandelions when you blow on them and it releases those and those float around in the air and, sp and puts more weeds in your yard. Well, Pacillopora can do that and be more Pacillopora in your tank, which some might consider to be a weed. I actually have two pieces of Pacillopora in my tank now. I've had it in the past. I've never seen it spread. I've never seen it appear somewhere else. And uh, I, I never was, uh, I've never had to regret owning it. I like it. I think it's really cool. Uh, I do want to mention, back in my 280, I was feeding like crazy. My phosphates were always sky high. And I put in so much nori in my tank. I was dumping in two liter bottles of phytoplankton in my tank. And I do remember I had two bastria showing up all over the place. Just little polyps. You know, I never actually had full-fledged two bastria sun corals everywhere, which would have been really cool. It was more like, here's a little one, there's a little one. There's a oh, I can't wait to see that grow. And it never really did. Those would have happened through spawning and just landing somewhere else in the tank. That was not like the Pacillopora where it spits out a polyp. These two bastia literally would have been exit landed somewhere and started to grow. So that is that did happen. I never saw it happen, but it clearly did. But I didn't have success. I would have had to go around the tank literally targeting it, each of those little polyps if they happen to be open with some food. Or I would have had to use things like Vanna Reef, Reef Roids, uh, oyster feast from reef nutrition, um, you know, just some kind of broadcast feeding to really get every little mouth on the tank and hopefully hit some of those to get more of them. And if you look at Richard Ross's tank, he's got tubastria and dendrophilia and lots of other pretty corals all over the place. And I'm sure he squirts food at certain large masses, but I, I know the way Rich is and I just don't picture him going and finding every single one and giving every single one of them food. I just don't think he's doing that. And Rich, if you're watching this, feel free to let me know if I'm correct, because I think I know you by now. <laughs> uh, another one that sometimes happens in people's tanks, they will see their micro brittle stars will spawn. They will suddenly all ascend to the top highest point they can of the rock work, wherever they are in the tank. If there's a rock over here, it may go to the highest point there, and then you've got all these rocks here, and you got 50 more up here at the top, and they all go to the top, and they lift a couple of arms up. <laughs> They have a couple of arms down on the rock and they spawn their stuff into the water column and your tank gets a little cloudy. And I filmed that one and that one is in, that was actually a reef diary. So I put that on the playlist today. So that one's included if you want to see this in action to kind of understand what it looks like, to recognize it in your own system. They, I found out that day how many I had in the tank. I have thousands and thousands of them and that's okay that they are not, they don't have the mass to really hurt your system. Again, it would have to be tens of thousands in a nano system to hurt the water column. But if you are just, you know, if you have a small tank and you have a small plethora of these, I don't think it's enough to do damage. But in, in all things, we want to just be, be aware, be alert, and be ready to intercede if you need to. But with micro brittle starfish, I don't think you'll need to. I was trying to think if I've seen any of my regular serpent starfish uh, spawn in my tank, you know, release some eggs or some sperm. And it may have happened, but it, it doesn't stick in my memory. So, uh, and I never ended up with new ones <laughs> either. So if you're hoping for shrimp, uh, for uh, starfish to make more starfish through spawning, probably not gonna happen. Now shrimp spawn in the tank a little bit differently. They Oops, wrong spot. I'm trying to keep track of what I'm doing here so I don't lose my spot on my notes. Shrimp like peppermint shrimp, cleaner shrimp, blood shrimp, um, well, even mantis shrimp, and I'm trying to, uh, I, what else do I see? Pacillopora crabs. All these different animals will have massive <clears throat> clutches of eggs against their abdomen, and then at one point, usually right at lights out, they will just release these into the water column and they go flying. I mean, literally swimming, I should say, not flying. Swimming up into the water column and they're everywhere. And I watched my peppermint shrimp do that on many occasions. Matter of fact, it was kind of a sense of pride that the peppermint shrimp that I had, and this was back in the uh, old days of the anemone cube, you know, the early years, 
they were constantly carrying eggs. I felt like I was doing a really good job because these shrimp were always, they had an egg mass on their stomach. You'd see these bright green uh, little dots inside their abdomen. You could see it through the carapace. And then it would eventually grow and grow until it was like super inflated, like a pregnant woman. And it would be a different color. It wouldn't be that bright green anymore. It'd be more of a, a gray look to it. You know, yeah, gray sounds right. And then that night they would just either swim up and release like, like jerk and set it flying, or they would go to, you know, depending on the creature we're talking about, go to, again to the peak of the rock work and then start fanning them out. Oh, emerald crabs are another one that does this where they just kind of open up a couple of their hardened shell and just send the babies off to go figure out how to stay alive. And I filmed the peppermint shrimp. And so there's a video of that on the playlist you can check out. They look like little tiny angels. They're really, really pretty. And when I was looking at them, I mean, they were so small that when I was looking at them, I actually was looking at them upside down. I didn't realize which part was the tail and which part was the head. And it took a while and a few different photo sessions to even figure out what I was looking at, you know, specifically to understand, oh, okay. So the wider part is the, the fan end of the tail. So if you happen to catch that, it's a really cool event. Uh, you will not end up with tons of them. You would have to actually capture them and again, put them in a separate tank, feed them really well, uh, wait for the settlement phase, and then hopefully you would have some decent sized ones to put back in your tank one day. But uh, it's, it's no small task. It's a real job but it's really cool to observe. So at the very least, watch it happen, even if you can't raise them. I think it's so much fun. So I told you guys, no, nah, I'm not gonna say it yet, I'm gonna save it. Uh, another thing that I've seen spawn in my tank, and I didn't know what it was, and I had to have you know a fish breeder tell me, I had this weird thing that looked like a million whitish eggs all glued together, which I believe they call an egg raft. And they were on the underside of a rock and just kind of doing this in the breeze. That's what caught my eye. I was like, what the heck is that? I've never seen that there. That's never been there before. What is that? Took some pictures. And uh, the overwhelming belief from those that know more than I do said they are relatively sure that that was chromus eggs that have been laid as a clutch. But like with a clown, every egg on the surface of whatever they're gluing them to. This was more like this weird white leaf that just kept moving back and forth. And the parents were even around. There was no fish near it. There was no way to even think that it was happening. And so I, uh, you know, I saw them and then one day they were gone. You know, I didn't, see, I didn't get little tiny chromis. Uh, I also had three striped damselfish. And those things lay a giant, okay, so the fish was about this big. And it was this huge circle, the size of a grapefruit or larger, of eggs on the back wall of my frag tank. And this would happen, uh, I'd say, once a month. Just a billion eggs were, were glued straight to the back wall of the tank. You just see this big, giant circle, and she would guard it and protect it. So you could that kind of uh, spawning you'll observe. Mandarins are known to spawn. If you aren't familiar with their approach... The male and female will swim upward at dusk, so the tank is in the blue phase, and it's usually right before lights out, and they swim together like this all the way up, and then they burst apart. And right then when they do that is when they'd release sperm and eggs at the same time. And they will do this dance repeatedly, and there's lots and lots of video of the Mandarin dance. So if you want to check that out, definitely check me you on know, YouTube. You'll find it. There are lots of opportunities for that. And as far as I know... Well, I mean, I do, I do know it's always fish food. It's not baby mandarins. But clearly in the ocean, this is working, and they don't all get devoured, and somehow little mandarins happen. Fortunately, we have tank-raised ones now from Biota and other companies that are growing them from nothing. Matt Wittenrich was one of the people that figured out how to breed them in the first place, and it was very frustrating for him. It took him many, many, many... It took him a long time. I was going to say many months. It might have been longer. But I do realize, I, I do remember the story vividly of how he finally figured out what they needed to eat to live. And it was the craziest accident. It wasn't planned. And if you haven't heard the story, hopefully you'll appreciate this. So he had this tank with the mandarins in it, and he had the mandarin babies in there, and he tried all these different foods, and nothing was working. And in the middle of his crazy laboratory, he had this tank with some sea hares. 
And sea hares are those cute little underwater bunnies that eat algae. And his sea hares, uh, sea hares, sea hares were releasing, were, God, I can't even say it, were releasing these weird, like, noodles, like spaghetti patches. And he's like, what is this crap? And he kept, kept throwing it away and throwing it away. And it was the sea hares were spawning. They were releasing their eggs in these weird ribbons, like spaghetti noodles. And he accidentally dropped a little bit into the mandarin tank, the grow-out tank. And this mandarin swam up and just slurped it up like we slurp up spaghetti. And he was like, what just happened? And so he did a little bit more. And he found out that they will eat sea hare eggs. And he finally cracked the code. I mean, he's like, now I know what to do. Now, I don't know if that's what Biota is doing to this day. But... I remember he was ecstatic. He gave a Macna talk about this, and he was just about dancing at the podium, how happy he was to finally figure out what food was needed to get into the baby mandarin fry so it could turn into a mandarin that could be viable to the point where it could grow larger, and then eventually we started to buy tank-raised mandarins from ORA, and they were known to eat pellet food and different foods because they were trained that way, and it was really exciting. Uh, ORA at one point stopped because everyone was complaining that it wouldn't eat their pellet food. They're like, these fish aren't smart, they're stupid, whatever. And people were complaining. I was like, oh my God, you do realize it's still a living animal. I mean, I have a dog that's picky about its food, right? And just because it's not eating the pellets you're putting in doesn't mean the fish won't eat. you got to keep trying. But anyway, the backlash wouldn't stop. And ORA finally said, you know what? It's not worth the hassle. We're not selling them anymore. So I'm really glad that Biota is. And... Uh, like I said, I don't know if Iota is using sea hair eggs to to crack, you know, to make more and more of them, but that was a really neat discovery Matt Wittenrich did. Cardinal fish and pajama cardinals are, are two kinds of fish that will spawn from female to male, and the male carries eggs in their mouth. And they carry in their mouth quite a long time. And so while the male is swimming around with a mouthful of eggs, he cannot eat food. He's literally foregoing eating to make sure the babies are safe in his mouth. And he's constantly like breathing through his mouth <clears throat> more than you would expect from a fish to keep those eggs tumbling. They will yawn. You'll see a little hint of the eggs. And then eventually that fish may spit them out. Now, some people that have these fish in their care and see the male carrying may reach into the tank and take the male out and basically hold him by the tail and make him spit out those eggs and then end up with and they can raise the babies. And sometimes people just accidentally discover down in their sump a baby Bengai fish that they didn't know even exist. They didn't even know there was eggs or spawning, and yet they have these tiny little Bengais in there. And so they would then quickly either get urchins, like a long-spined urchin, or they'd make something out of basically Play-Doh and, and toothpicks. They'd make a fake one and put that in the tank and put the babies right near it, and they would go inside there for safety so they can't be eaten. And they would, you know, get fed there. And as they got larger and larger, they could finally join the reef. And that was a really cool thing. So that kind of spawning happens. Clams can spawn in your tank, too. Now, clams are going to cause all kinds of chaos. And there was a thread I stumbled across. I was doing some kind of internet sleuthing like I always do. And I was chasing... Oh, I know what it was. I was trying to find the article of the tank of the month that talked about the interruptus angelfish. I was like, where did I see that for the first time? I was going to find the article. And instead I went down a rabbit hole and I ended up on John Coppolino's build thread on Reef Central from back in the day. And he was talking about his, he had this monster tank that had a huge gigas clam in it. Now, gigas clam are the giant ones. These are the giant clams. Sometimes you see them at public aquariums. You might have saw people eating them on Survivor because they didn't know better. And uh, I remember the government, the local government was furious with the uh, participants for destroying these animals that lived so long. But John had one of these giant things in his tank, and it spawned and turned his whole tank milky white, and he couldn't see anything. And I was just kind of reading over it, and basically he did massive water changes, did what he could to save the reef, and and try to reduce the losses because it was much too much. He kept saying, if this clam ever spawns, I'm fine because my whole water ecosystem is like 1,500 gallons. And he discovered that clam said, oh, really? Here, hold my beer. And it caused chaos. So I don't, like I said, I don't remember the, the, um, the losses. I wasn't really, that wasn't the purpose of what I was searching for. But the story caught my eye. And he ended up giving that giant clam to, 
to Joe at the 20,000 gallon aquarium. And there's Joe with this huge Rubbermaid tote with a clam in it. And then he's lowering it into his 20,000 gallon reef. And that was part of his reef. It came from John Coppolino, which is a really cool story. Um, so yes, clams also can spawn. Urchins are known to spawn in our tank. Now, this is one of those ones where if you don't recognize it, you might say, oh, that's spawning when it's not. <laughs> spawning is pretty specific. Normally, whatever they're spawning floats away. If you're looking at an urchin, it's up on your rock work, and you see little white, what looks like grains of sand falling down, that's urchin poop. That is not urchin spawn. So the, it's processing what it ate, and it's, it's just spitting that crap out, and it's just falling down like little tiny... It's not even a waterfall because it's so few, but it's, you, you see these little white grains falling, that is just urchin poop. But if it releases the smoke into the water, that will go upward. If it's eggs, they would drift upward. And so that is the difference when it comes to that. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about from spawning was the one I saw on Facebook yesterday. Shocked, Krista Pechia was showing Christmas tree worms spawning. Makes sense. I mean, we've seen, oh, and I even mentioned bristle worms, they spawn too. Uh, so worms will literally like just kind of lift their head like a snake does, and then you'll just see the, the spawn coming from their waist. <laughs> if you could say there's a waist on a worm. But uh, the, uh, the Christmas tree worms are spawning, and I was like, number one, I was impressed she had Christmas tree worms, because a lot of people don't. You have to buy a Porites rock. It's covered in these Christmas tree worms, and historically they were beautiful, but they didn't live long in our tanks, and the Porites tend to die off. Then the Christmas tree worms died off, and you lost the pagarita crabs that were shrimp that were living in the rock work. It was a really cool you know, thing to have. But she said she's had hers for seven years. So clearly, I would love to talk with her more and find out more about how she's keeping these alive long term, because that's, that's exciting. And I would love to see if those are still something you can get to this day, because I haven't seen those in a fish store in forever. But to get a Christmas tree rock would be really cool and her getting to see the spawning is what led me to find out about what she's doing. So that's exciting. Um, and then there's all kinds of other breeding stuff. I mean, you can start talking about seahorses breeding and all that. I, I didn't really want to get into breeding. I want to talk about spawning. So those are the ones that I have to share with you today. And uh, I kind of used up my topic. Let's see how we're doing on time. Eh, we're doing good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to transition away from this topic and start answering your questions. If you didn't know to do this, Whenever you ask a question in the live chat, please type at Mila's Reef and then your question uh, helps me notice it. But I'm going to scroll to the top of the list now and see what was said thus far and see if I can start answering a few questions. And then, like I said, if you want to watch my playlist, it's in the video's description and you can check out some of the cool spawning events that have happened to me over the years. Not to me, to my reef over the years. Let's see. Uh, Jose says, what happened with the new anthias? How are they doing? They are doing great. The male has been hanging out near the other male and not fighting, which is really good. So the liar tail and the bimaculatus are not arguing, which I was worried about. And then the female bimaculatus is staying in the back of the reef under the pruritus, uh I'm sorry, the uh, stylophora, the milka coral. It's underneath that rock right at the sand. But when I feed the interruptus angelfish, I'm using arctopods. And arctopods are from Reef Nutrition. I have this huge bottle. One of those bottles is like $75. And I take a little bit of that and I pour it into a little tiny shot glass and I add a little bit of RO or tank water and I use a pipette and I squirt some into the peacemaker. And that way the, uh, the angelfish can get a meal. And it's responding really well to this specific food. It is going after it. Every single time I bring the pipette in, the fish is waiting, which is great. I do a puff or two or three, and the food's blown around in the box, and of course some of it's going out the holes, but the little angelfish is getting food. And then I noticed the extra food that was getting out, plus whatever's left in my shot glass I poured into the reef, the, the female bimac was coming out and gobbling some up. And of course the other antheists got excited as well. Antheists love plankton-sized food, much more so than like mysis or you know some kind of meaty food. They really like the tiny stuff. So I ordered on... Thursday, I didn't know I could do this, <laughs> but I contacted Chad at Reef Nutrition and said, hey, how much is that big bottle of Arctopods? Because at the fish store, they have these smaller bottles, these little round bottles. And I knew I wanted a large amount because I'm feeding these Antheus and the angelfish. 
And he said, that's $74, $72.50, I don't know, something like that. And I was like, okay, and how do I go ahead and place that order? And he's like, at the website. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I could do this. So I placed my order. Now, here's something that I didn't expect. There's two choices. There's two-day shipping or there's overnight. And for me, especially something that's frozen or chilled or like livestock, I always do overnight shipping. I don't trust two-day because what if something goes wrong? And so I went ahead and paid for overnight shipping. And then Chad said, uh, you paid for overnight. We pack our food really well. Two-day shipping is fine. I was like, I don't know. Next Tuesday, it's going to be 100 degrees here. And he said, nope, it's going to be fine. We'll probably refund you the difference. And the difference was like $33 versus $55 shipping. I was like, okay, do whatever you feel you need to do. And then he wrote me back again. He says, you know what? We looked at your, 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 uh, your weather again. And we looked at the problem we're having with FedEx not delivering on time. So we are going to leave it at overnight shipping. So if something goes wrong, there's still enough, you know, our coolers are really thick. There's still a chance again. He says, let's not take a risk with two day shipping. So I said, that's fine. So the food should be here. It ships Monday, it should be here Tuesday during the heat wave. And I'll have a giant bottle full so I can keep feeding my babies and keep them fat and happy. <laughs> okay, Rasmus has some tips for us. He says, razor from Brightwell uh, murder cyanobacteria. That's interesting. And also, if you have to replace your noisy NIOS 160 pump, I've never had to do that. He says, save it for a water change. It's really strong, can move water fast. Happy Saturday. Thank you very much for letting us know that. Oh, let me talk about the Interruptus. Uh, so Adam says it's great seeing it pop in and out every once in a while over your shoulder. So the box itself, I mean, think about it. This fish is so expensive, and I don't want to scare it. But I can't see through the box because it's growing algae, probably because I'm putting trace elements, and the film algae is getting pretty thick. So I grabbed a very thin... I, Caitlin and I bought this package of, um, uh, like, Magic Eraser. It was an off-brand. And they're very thin. I mean, what do I compare them to? I'll show it to you. It's easier. <laughs> so it looks like this. It's very, very thin. Um, that's not even an eighth of an inch. And uh, just this little rectangle. And so I use this in the, on the outside of the Peacemaker to wipe off all the walls and the bottom. And then I took off the lid and I worked my way down the inside, but I didn't want to scare the fish. I don't want to give it a heart attack and have it die just because I'm cleaning the tank. It's, you know, the, the area it's in. Uh, it's just in there now until the tank next to me here is done cycling. So for now, it's just hanging out and being fed and being loved and I'm enjoying the view, but I have to clean the box again today. I'll have to be very careful and go very slowly. And I want to rub down all the walls to make sure that the acrylic stays clear. And then I also wipe off all the dust off the bottom, you know, the, the sediment. I need to really vacuum that out or, or turkey baste it out or something. Because all that stuff on the bottom of the box actually creates a shadow. And so the light above the peacemaker, the peacemaker is a shadow. And so the corals underneath it aren't getting as much light as they normally do. And that box has already been there for a solid week. Uh, for It's been there for uh, eight days now in a row. So I want to make sure that the hammers are not losing their light. And, you know, I mean, looking at it in person, it looks kind of dim down there. So I need to clean it. So I'll be doing that today. But I'm looking forward to sharing with you the new tank soon. It's very exciting. But I have been filming and filming and taking videos and notes and stuff. So I should have a nice little video to share with you about setting up that tank. Uh, Adam says, Spock wants that Calerpa. I don't know. And to be honest, a couple of leaves try to work their way out one hole. And I just carefully pulled them back in because I do not want Calerpa loose in my reef tank. I don't mind it being in the refugium, but I don't want it taking root on my rock work. Manuel says, my snails recently spawned, and I was in shock. I'd never seen that before. Oh, thank you. EIY says, <laughs> EIY, is that E-I-Y-O-U? All right, whatever. Um, do feather duster worms spawn in the tank? Yes, they definitely can. Just like the crystal tree worms, those are kind of a feather duster type of animal, and they spawn. So yes, they definitely would. Wow. 
today, I'm just going to, it's a long name. It's, well, no, it's not today. It's Tadayoshi CG. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're saying there. Uh, it says, my nitrates are between 80 and 160 for two months already, but the corals are growing and happy. No algae. Well, that makes sense. Uh, the When there's a really high nitrate level, it may not be toxic to your fish. They can tolerate quite a bit, but it can start to do some damage to them. But it will also inhibit some algae growth in the tank because the nitrate's so high. But you said the corals are growing and doing well. I'm wondering what kind of corals you have. I would say you need to bring the nitrate down. I mean, mine were up for a long time and I was trying different methods to make it come down. And uh, I tried for a long, long time. And finally, I just literally addressed the tank. I went in with a big cleanup and vacuumed the sand bed over about four or five sessions. And that got them down to where they're closer to 30 now instead of being 80. So if your numbers are up really high, you're gonna want those to be lower. I, you really would. Long term, it's gonna be better for, the, for all the livestock. Tommy says, my local fish store does free water tests, and one of the tests they check is oxygen. How come you don't hear more about oxygen testing in the reefing community? I wonder how they're testing that. I wonder what device they're using to measure it. I mean, that's a, you, you raise a good question, and it's not something that's typically looked at, um, probably because the device may cost quite a bit. And this could be some kind of a... This sounds derogatory. It's not meant that way. This could be kind of a shtick, like hey, we measure oxygen levels. No one does that. Come to our store. Maybe that's a way to draw you in to get loyalty, customer loyalty. It could be. But uh, so what were your numbers? What did you get? <laughs> I read that so many times. So Rick says, I just got in cell phone range. I'll have to listen to what I missed later. <laughs> and he says hi to all of us. But I was like, cellophane, and I thought it said cellophane rage. And I was like, he got in cellophane rage. What is that? Uh, Jam wants to know how the mangrove vase is doing. Could you give us an update? It's over there next to my orchids, and it still has leaves. I still think I need to put some kind of a light directly above it, and I haven't pulled the trigger on anything. I mean, I, I want something small and, uh, you know, and focused and uh, inexpensive and lightweight. And, you know, but then again, I was thinking maybe I should move the mangroves into this new tank next to me. Maybe. I don't know. So I'm playing with different ideas, you know, just, just spitballing ideas right now. I don't know. There's, there will be a light over this tank, so in theory, the mangroves could be okay, but you know mangroves are always taller than the light fixture. So I almost need like a second light above it again. So I'm right back to the whole, the mangroves need their own light. But nope, they're still doing okay. And I just top off that tank every single day with a little shot glass of RO water to maintain salinity. And the water in that tank is, last I checked, was 1.023. I should check it again today, because today is water test Saturday. Uh, Michael says, I will be driving between Denver and Austin, San Antonio in August for a road trip. That is a long road trip. Are there any cool aquarium coral related places to stop at along the way? Oh my, I'm sure there are tons. So the question is going to be, how far do you want to deviate off your, your uh, route? If you live in Denver and you're driving down to San Antonio, you definitely have to go to the Denver downtown aquarium. I went there. I really loved it. I still have their coffee mug and I drink out of it a lot when I'm not drinking out of this one. And I believe it was a Denver downtown aquarium that had a tiger in an enclosure surrounded by water, and the tiger was swimming. I never knew tigers swam. You know, I, I know cats hate water. And this thing was swimming, like, not like accidentally fell in and had to swim. Like, got in there and started swimming across the enclosure. I was, I was really amazed. It was really cool. So, uh, like I said, if you live there, go there. If you don't live there, you should go there. <laughs> Uh, if you're in, once you're in the San Antonio area, uh, I would tell you go to SeaWorld because they have their own, you know, they have all their stuff. And of course they've got reef tanks and some other things. They, some of the corals they grow were in my tank at one time. I remember I had two SeaWorld corals that I purchased at a frag swap. I was at this frag swap. It was probably the San Antonio club I was visiting, or maybe 
it was next wave and they came up i don't know what but this one vendor was selling and they were actually sea world people <laughs> and these were all sea world corals like that is awesome i want that and that and so i put them in my tank and you know unfortunately they didn't live forever like you hope but i i had had them for many years and uh then one day i just didn't it, it could have been because the shadow caster got too big and created a huge shadow and everything underneath that was you know not getting light was dying and it could have been that's how i lost it could have been something out competed and, and beat it it could be something you know it succumbed to something i don't know but i remember i had a red acro from sea world and uh it was really pretty for a long time and then one day i just didn't have it yes joe did he reset his twenty thousand gallon reef tank uh, about Oh, six to eight months ago, drained the tank down to every drop of water out of it, cleaned it completely, removed all the rock, put all new rock, restarted it. He posted some pictures of the reef from above um, about a week ago. And so, of course, I had to tease him because everything was new and different. And I was like, whose tank is this? <laughs> and he didn't even react. He should have had some kind of a Seinfeld meme to come back at me with, but he didn't. But yeah, it was sort of like new phone who dis. I was like, whose tank is that? Um, so it's going to take a long time to get back to where it was, which was phenomenal. And that is another video I need to release. Two years ago, I drove out to New York to pick up Caitlin. And when I was there, I went to Joe's tank and filmed it. So I have probably one of the last recordings of his tank before it was, you know, eventually taken down. So I need to get that footage Paste it together in Final Cut Pro and put a video up on YouTube for you guys. Uh, Fishbone says, I saw that Christmas tree spawning video on Facebook. Will she end up with more Christmas tree worms? Probably not. I, I mean, just, I don't think so. It just depends on what she's got set up, where they're at, what kind of filtration is on that tank. If it's a very simple system that doesn't have filtration and just relies on water changes, for example, there's a chance something could appear somewhere. That would be really cool. But the fact that she kept them alive anyway for seven years is what impressed me even more. Spawning just means you're doing a good job. But keeping them alive long term, that is great husbandry. Let's see. <laughs> Fish Tank Freak says, yep, that's Denver. Tigers like the water. Uh, if you come through the Dallas-Fort Worth area on your way to San Antonio, if you choose to go that route, you have to go to the Dallas World Aquarium. You absolutely have to. I have never released a full video about that place because I really wanted to come in after hours when there's no crowds, and I wanted to film everything in a way where I had like a cloth backdrop behind me so there's no reflection, so you can just really appreciate the tank and not see the city behind me with cars driving by and, you know, daylight. And I can't get permission to do that. It's just, it's one of these things. They're a little, I, they're cautious. You know, they always want good publicity. They don't want anything negative. And so the owner wants this perfect experience and I get it. So I'm just gonna have to sneak in there when I just start filming just like a regular average Joe and just give you guys what I can get and do the best I can to capture what I can and deal with reflections as, you know, as part of photography. You just have to do a good job. But I would really like to share that because that's such a wonderful place. So if you're not familiar with it, it's a three-story high facility that has another huge building next door that's filled with their laboratories and their propagation. Their, uh, they have an entire room dedicated to live foods. They have an entire kitchen for the animals because they feed everything in that place and they're a catering business on top of it matter of fact the catering business is what helped pay for the dallas world aquarium and they do events in there where you can actually get engaged or married uh their conferences happen there and and you'll have catered food you'll you'll get the fancy food and they have this one restaurant downstairs in front of all the big tanks where they have all these foods from around the world and i remember eating food from australia there one visit and then from a different place the next visit and I really enjoy that. I love that place. I go there once or twice a year, and I haven't been there in a while because of COVID. But the nice thing, I told you, it's three stories. So there's a path that just winds up and up and up, or you can do an elevator and then walk your way down. And the path takes you, well, the top area, the highest point, 
there's toucans. The owner loves toucans, and he has like every kind of toucan you can imagine. He's got them. And you can even buy fruit and put your fingers through a small hole, and the toucan will take like these berries from you, and so you can feed them. They also have some monkeys in there, and some of these animals are actually loose and just kind of like they've gotten, they're out and about, and you just look up, and there's one going that away. But most are in their enclosures. And then as you work your way down to the middle level, you'll see the flamingos, and they're gorgeous, and then they have some kind of a, a rare cat, uh, like a panther or a, or a turn. So like one animal's on display, and then that one goes away to take a nap or eat or whatever, and the other one goes on to display. And then as you work your way down, then you get down to all these tanks, and they have these huge, massive tanks with like manatees in there. And they've got this other one, like huge alligator. And then they've got this area with the snakes for the snake people, and the spiders for the spider people. And the cockroaches for the cockroach people. None of that stuff interests me. But then there's the fish tanks, and I love those. And they also have a huge shark uh, pool. And uh, they have a tunnel that you can go through where you'll see the rays and the sharks swimming overhead. And uh, then they have these 1,500-gallon ecosystems. And they were different. Well, they were. They may still be different parts of the world. So like... <clears throat> Uh, Lord, Ho I, the Lord Hoenzis Island that's off of Australia, they had a Lord Hoenzis tank and it had fish from that area. And then they had, you know, a Fiji tank and then they had a, this tank and that tank. And each one has the name of the place over the top. And then you look and you'll see animals that are endemic to that area. So wonderful place to go. Very kid friendly. They have a massive gift shop if you have to go home with all kinds of plushies and goodies. Very educational. Uh, very happy, healthy animals. Oh, did I mention they have penguins? And they are the outdoor penguins because this is Texas. So they have the African penguins that like the heat. And then they have this like lazy river type thing that the penguins will follow. And you can just see through the window. You can see the penguins going by. Or you can look down below and there they are sunning themselves because they don't need the cold. Anyway, fantastic place to go. I would highly recommend it. Um, and then on your way down through... Austin, there are a couple of unique type of fish stores. There was one that I've been to a few times called Aqua Dome, and it actually looks like a, a salad bowl upside down, just a dome. And you go inside, and this place has been around for a long time, and there's a staircase that goes up. I think it's a curlicue staircase or just a staircase that goes up. And I just remember it was rusting <laughs> because there's so much humidity in there. So there's all these tanks down below. When you went upstairs, all the cool stuff was up there. And they had these tanks with these little cubbies and all the stuff that was more delicate, more um, my kind of thing that I'd want to buy was all up there. So if you go to Aquadome, you got to go upstairs and see what kind of goodies are up there because that'll be the fun area. And it's just fun to be inside this weird building. So that's a few of the places I can think of. I'm sure there's probably 50 more if I really put my brain to it. But if you have the uh, Reef Trace app on your phone, you can open up the LFS locator as you're driving, and you can see whatever's within 45 miles of you all the way down your route. And you can move the marker ahead of you and see if there's anything that pops up in those areas. And uh, also, if something's missing, you can suggest it. And if something has closed down and is gone, you can report it so we can keep the app nice and up to date. Let's see. MB Coral Reefing is telling me something here. I have a diatome algae growing in my 130 gallon tank. I don't want to drain and restart it. Um, I will sponge clean it and it will spread 10 times worse. I used UV light to keep it and kept it dark for a while. It's just set up. It's not my main display. I don't mind restarting. I don't want to waste the water. All right, well, uh, diatoms are usually food for bacteria. You might try throwing something at it like Live Rock Enhance and see if that helps to consume this stuff. Um, if you don't want to use Live Rock I sell that, and if you don't want to use that and you want to try something else, Microbacter 7 is known to work on getting rid of the brown stuff off the sand bed. I carry that as well. So Microbacter 7 or Live Rock Enhance might be a cure. You don't have to waste any water. You don't have to break down your tank. Normally, dino, uh, sorry, diatoms are not an issue. They're not a thing that makes you want to break down a tank and start over. Dinoflagellates are. 
So you said diatoms. Diatoms are okay. Dinoflagellates, that's a whole other battle, and that you might want to actually, you know, if nothing's in there and you're just kind of getting it going and it's just a nightmare. Uh, also, you didn't mention any livestock. You made it sound like it's just water, like because you said you have a display and then you have this tank. So if this tank has nothing in it, why are the lights on at all? <clears throat> so lights could be fueling some kind of diatom growth there. Uh, hmm, how do I say this? Cajetal? I have received my ICP test result and iodine is very low. What consequences are there for low iodine? My Montipora digitata is very pale and nearly dead. Okay, so I don't believe the iodine is related to your Montipora problem, but you know, I'm not going to say it can't be because maybe I'm wrong, but you can dose iodine and bring that back up. Uh, what I like to do is buy something called Lugol's Solution. It's a very concentrated iodine and you use one drop of iodine per 50 gallons of water once a week. So you could do that. Don't go crazy. Don't say, oh, I better add a bunch because you know it's low because if you use too much iodine, your fish will suddenly start gasping and there's nothing you can do to soak up the iodine and get it out of the system. I made that mistake once with a 29 gallon. I put in my drops like, well, that's ridiculous. That's nothing. So I put in another drop and all of a sudden my clownfish are like, uh, 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 and their eyes seem to get bigger. <clears throat> and I was freaking out. And I'm like, I just killed my fish, you know? About five minutes later, they kind of calmed down again. I was like, okay, thank God. So one drop per 50 gallons. There's other products on the market that are watered down. Uh, Brightwell sells iodine or iodide, which you can buy and you can dose per prescription of what it says on the bottle, just following the instructions. And you can bring that up. We don't want to use too much. Now the benefit of iodine in the water usually is to help shrimp and crabs molt. Because if they don't have enough iodine in the water, they can't. They, they're stuck in their exoskeleton. So we want to make sure there's a proper level of iodine so that they can properly molt every, what is it, two to three weeks. And um, if your Montipora suddenly did, did better because of iodine, I'd be really surprised. Usually Montipora is a pretty hardy coral, but it loves magnesium. So if your magnesium level is low, if it's less, like let's say it's less than 1,200 or just barely 1,200, that's too low for Montipora. Also, if your lights are running too long, all day long, just too much intensity for too long a duration, that can bleach out of Montipora. Or it could just be things are not right in your tank yet. It's the wrong time to put Montipora in. I mean, there's so many different things, and I have like three sentences to give you any kind of analysis, and that's no way to help you. So if you want to join Club Mila's Reef and post pictures and add all this information about your tank, we'll be happy to give you assistance and help you figure out what's going on. You may not... That one may not survive, but maybe the next one you put in will do really well because you got things straightened out and you've got your water parameters perfect. <clears throat> All right, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, I do want to remind you that today is water test Saturday. We want to test all our water parameters. This is going to go to uh, MB Coral Reefing specifically. We want to make sure that you're testing alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate, salinity, make sure the water temperature is right, possibly measure potassium. I'm glad you did an ICP test, but it is not the end all <clears throat> of all you know, testing. It is another series of results we look at to determine what to do with our tank. And in the beginning of this live stream, I talked about how I'm low in certain trace elements. So now I'm dosing those specifically, and I'm going to send another ICP test to see if it worked. And then we'll have to see if the ICP says yes. And I'm hoping that it does. But by testing your water weekly or more frequently, you're going to have a much better chance, chance for success than if you just look at your tank and say, well, the corals look fine, the fish are fine. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day who had a picture of their fish, and there was this gaping hole on the side of its head. And I was not sure what I was looking at. And then he explained, and he says, it's fine. And I was like, if there was a gaping hole on the side of your head, I wouldn't say you're fine. That fish is not fine. It may be swimming and it may be eating, but there's something not right. And you need someone that's a fish disease expert, like Humblefish, to help you. But with our tanks, there's a lot of different things that can happen. And no one person has all the answers, but we definitely want to stick to the basics. And, you know, that way, you know, test water testing is like the first thing you do when you set up a tank. And I think people just get bored. They hate it. They find it's too cumbersome. It's too annoying. It takes too long. Well, I sell something called the Smart Stir on my website. It's a magnetic stirrer about this big, 
you plug it into a USB uh, charger to charge it up for like an hour or two, and then you can use that thing for months on a single charge. It has a little tiny magnetic bead in there, and as you put in the drops, it's stirring, so you don't have to shake the vial. Drop, shake, drop, shake. I mean, I don't even like doing that. I've been using a magnetic stirrer myself for probably four years. Whenever I released the video of the 3D printed one that was gifted to me, that's when I started and I've never looked back. I hate doing any test without that stirrer. And then when Auto Aqua came out with theirs, uh, which is the one I sell on my website, it's a no-brainer. I mean, I love that thing. And if you don't like water testing now, once you have that, you'll like it better. <laughs> it's still got to be tested, but it's going to be more fun. So I do recommend it. I sell those on my website. They're like 30 bucks. So if you haven't got one yet, you're doing yourself a disservice, and uh, you should get one today. All right, guys, I hope you have a great week. I will see you again next weekend, and uh, 